great to have you here today, first Sunday of the month. We're gathering as just two congregations, of course, on the first Sunday. I hope you've had a good summer, if not a great summer, that you feel rested and relaxed and raring to go as we begin a new church year together. And we have a new Sunday morning series to kick off uh, uh, our new church year. It's the letter of, of the Philippians, and it's this theme, the gospel-centered church. But I want to go back to the 1980s. I know some of you weren't around then. Some of us were in our prime in the 1980s. This was the decade of the microwave. You remember? The Sony Walkman and the home computer. But it was also the decade that gave us the seeker-sensitive church. Remember that? Willow Creek uh, in Illinois developed a model which tried to engage with those who were either drifting from traditional church or for whom Christianity had become, frankly, a no-go area. And over the following years, an epidemic of alternative uh, churches and models came online. Remember purpose-driven church, uh, pub church, emerging church, crowded house church, cafe church, messy church. And most recently, I read an article in one of our Christian uh, national newspapers just the other day with a feature on the post-program church. Post-program church is apparently one with everything trimmed right back. The diary is very light. There's only one Sunday service. There's only one midweek gathering. There are no age group ministries, no projects, no programs. Maybe we should try that one out, eh? The post-program church. Of course, it takes all types of churches to reach all types of people. But what all those different models are responding to is a perceived system failure and a culture change. Okay, sometimes they've been driven by too much sociology and not enough theology, and uh, some have merely replaced one technique with a more trendy, fashionable technique. But at least they are trying to address the the vital question. How do we develop church in such a way that it connects with those for whom the majority don't even see church as an option. You see, it's a question that that we at Lansdowne need to keep asking. Not least because here in the UK, only 10% of the population attend any church on a normal Sunday, while a further 10% attend a church every few months. You've got 40% that are now de-churched, having lost all meaningful uh, connection and contact with with the church within their lifetime. And you have another 40% who have never, ever attended a church at all, except perhaps for some wedding or funeral, some rite of passage. So here we go then. How could a letter written in AD 60, there or thereabouts, to a church in a Grecian hill town called Philippi, how can this letter to that context help us today? Well, for this reason. It shows us that whatever decade and whatever culture we are operating in, only gospel-centered churches will really cut it. What's a gospel-centered church? Well, firstly, it's a word-centered church. For the gospel is a message of good news. It's a word about the God who in Christ Jesus came on a rescue mission. So it it's, has to be a word-centered church. And and the second feature of a gospel-centered church is that it's therefore a mission-centered community. For for, for the gospel is a word to be proclaimed, to be lived out, to be fleshed out. All right, so far, so far, so obvious. I mean, few Christians, I think, will object to any of that. But here is where I suggest we might have a credibility problem. Because I think there's a gap between rhetoric and reality. You see, we say, oh, we're a Lansdowne's a gospel church. We're a word-centered church. We're a mission-centered church. We're gospel people. But does what we believe shape how we behave? You see, that's what this letter to the Philippians is really all about. 
Although the word joy is mentioned 14 times through the letter, it's not about joy. I mean, Chuck Swindoll writes a very helpful commentary, but the title of the commentary is completely bonkers. It's called Laugh Again. It's not about joy so much about how the gospel is meant to impact our lives and our communities. See, there's a striking phrase in in, in chapter 1. We'll deal with it in a few weeks' time. There it is in verse 27. Look in your Bibles. And after talking about partnership in the gospel and defending and confirming the gospel and the advance of the gospel in verse 12, what does Paul say there in verse 27? Whatever happens, Philippians, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You see, the truth of the gospel is more than a set of dogmas, more than a set of propositions. It shapes behavior. It shapes our manner, our conduct, our relationships. Uh, Philippians, as we know, is is essentially a thank you letter to the congregation from Paul for their practical love and support of him and his ministry over the years. But it also addresses issues like fractured relationships that were getting in the way of the gospel, which is why after verse 27, Paul goes on to say, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one for the faith of the gospel. So a real commitment to Christ And the gospel brings us all on the same page so that we stand as one. It unifies people, brings us together, not around personalities or even around position statements. It brings us around the grace of the good news. And it's that message that impacts conduct which provides clarity and purpose. It's the gospel that builds A community of people who shoulder together a great ambition. So how did it all start in Philippi? How did it all begin? Let's think a little bit more then about this gospel-centered church in Philippi. You really need to to read Acts 16. Maybe you can do that for homework uh, today. Read Acts 16 because that's the account of how the message of Jesus landed in mainland Europe. As a small group of men, Paul and Dr. Luke and Silas and Timothy, entered, entered Philippi. It must have looked pretty unimpressive. I mean, they could have been mistaken for, a, for day trippers out for a picnic by the river. But it was a Jewish prayer meeting that they were after. And eventually, uh, they, they, they find it. And so they joined this small and unlikely group, uh, among whom was a businesswoman, Lydia. Lydia had arrived at the prayer meeting that morning, a non-Christian. But she walks home from the prayer meeting, a baptized believer in Jesus. She and her household, the text says. And the explanation for this remarkable turnaround in her life? Well, Luke tells us in his account, as Paul shared the good news, the word, the message about Jesus, the lights go on. The Lord opened her heart. Do you see, friends, gospel-centered churches are communities where lives are transformed. People get saved in the old language. People get saved when God turns the lights on. And do you know what really, what really people like me want to see every week in a place like this and in Holdenhurst Road, is individuals turning up to worship, not knowing Christ, and going home totally different. That's what we're after, isn't it? That's a gospel-centered church where lives are transformed. And that was Lydia. And then there was this demon-possessed slave girl who was into the occult. Her owners made a fortune out of her fortune-telling dark arts. And Paul met her on his way to another prayer meeting. Paul was always going to prayer meetings in Philippi. Only this slave girl wasn't going there. 
No, no, she was ranting and raving, drawing the attention of startled onlookers to, to the message of Paul and his mission team. These men have come from the Most High God and are telling you how to be saved. You see, there's that theme tune again of a gospel-centered church. How to be saved? The way of salvation. And salvation was what this slave girl experiences. Having had enough of her stalking them, Paul releases her from, from the occult spirit in the name of Jesus. Good news for her. Not so good news for her masters, who have now lost a source of income. So they hire rent a mob to drag Paul and co. before the authorities on charges of practicing unlawful Roman customs. The magistrates play to the crowd. They order a public punishment beating. And they tell the jailer to, to, to put these men in the slammer for the night. But the following morning, realizing that because Philippi was a Roman colony and Paul was in fact a Roman citizen, he should not, or his friends, have been treated in that way. The authorities release them. Of course, later on in his travels, as a missionary, Paul will appeal to Caesar in Rome on that basis of the way he was being treated in order to protect the liberty, the freedom of the early Christian church to worship God and speak about Jesus. And it was probably there, while Paul was waiting for the outcome of his appeal to Caesar and in prison again, that he writes this letter to the church in Philippi. He talks in our passage about being in chains for Christ, defending and confirming the gospel. And he reminds this young congregation of what they saw him go through. Look, the end of chapter 1 and verse 29, we'll come to it again in a few weeks. It's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. What does that also therefore tell us about a gospel-centered church? Not only does it see lives transformed, but a gospel-centered church will experience suffering for Christ. Anyway, back, back to Acts 16, and, and we're in prison, and Paul and his friends, what do they do in prison? They hold a midnight praise party, and there's an earthquake, and somewhere in the city, the jailer turns to his wife and says, hey, I better go and check this out, better go, better go back to the jail, and when he gets back, he's relieved to find that nobody has escaped, so he, he's got a question for Paul, the question's interesting. What must I do to be saved? There is again. Now, you don't ask that kind of question, do you, unless something big has been rattling around inside your mind. I mean, we don't, do we? Of the thousands and thousands of people at the air show these, these last few days, only a few will be asking that kind of question. You see, nobody wrestles with it unless God is wrestling with them. And in answer to the question that the jailer asks Paul, Paul says, my man, believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then Luke reports, they spoke the words to him and all the others in the house. Then he and his family were baptized and he was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Brilliant. That, that's how gospel-centered churches begin. They are born in the proclamation of the word about Jesus. God opens hearts. He transforms lives. They are born in suffering. And they are born in diversity. You see what we've got in Philippi? A wealthy businesswoman, a dysfunctional slave girl, and a prison officer. The gospel of Jesus may be a one-size-fits-all message, but it doesn't generate a one-size-fits-all culture. The gospel creates disciples of Jesus, not clones. You can imagine what it must have been like to have this very wealthy businesswoman 
rocking up to services and involved in meetings with the former slave girl, demon-possessed individual in the prison water. The gospel-centered church produces that kind of multicolored culture. So let's get to the actual text of Philippians chapter 1. We haven't got there yet. This is where the sermon begins properly, all right? A gospel-centered church creates gospel-centered people. And there are two broad categories mentioned in the uh, opening verse. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the, the bishops, the overseers, and and, and the deacons. Two broad categories I want to highlight that, that, that make a gospel-centered people. Firstly, they are servants. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. In many of Paul's letters, he will begin, I'm an apostle. But not here. He self-identifies as a servant, or better, a slave of Jesus. That's interesting because in a Roman colony like Philippi, while slaves could enjoy good jobs, they were never free. But for Paul and Timothy, that's precisely what the gospel of Jesus had made them, free. So this, for Paul and his assistant Timothy, was a badge of honor. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus, Paul says. He's, he's, He's happy, is Paul to be known not by his academic learning, not by his apostolic status, but as a servant. Because Jesus, his Lord, was a servant king. That's the point. And that's why Paul includes the famous hymn to Jesus in in chapter 2 of the letter. Verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider himself is equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Your attitude, says Paul to the Philippian believers, let this mind of Jesus be in you. You see, servanthood isn't just something for people like Paul and Timothy. It's for all Christians. And perhaps Paul is making this point at the very outset of his letter because there were people in this church who weren't behaving as servants. Their manner wasn't worthy of the gospel. Like Euodia and Syntyche, whose divisive, factional behavior gets a mention in in chapter 4. But others too must have felt the, the nudge of conscience when Paul writes in that passage where the hymn to Jesus is sung, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. You see, the Apostle Paul is not just big on the gospel message, he's also very big on the gospel community, which is why so much of this letter is addressed to a kind of undertow of relationships that because of rivalry and and posturing are threatening the community. And as a result of that, a focus on the gospel is being lost. You see, folks, you cannot rock the boat if you're rowing it. Servant-hearted people row the boat. They don't rock it. So, servants. The second category of person here, saints. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. By the way, in case you've missed it, that's a description of all Christians. We're all saints if we're in Jesus. The the saints are certainly not Southampton supporters, although they are. The saints are not a special group of, 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 of super spiritual Christians. Now, what makes someone a Christian is not that they are in church, but that they are in Christ. So the real issue is is not where you're at this morning, but whether you're in. Yeah? There was a very, very exclusive sports club in Oxford called Vincent's. There still is. It only admitted women a few years ago. But back in my day, 
you just couldn't apply. You had to be invited. You had to be personally recommended by an existing member of Vincent's. It was as elite as they, they come. And the waiting list for Vincent's was, was long. It was all done by closed ballot. And the big question, in fact, the only question which seemed to, to matter in your first year if you were playing university sport was, are you in yet? <laughs> are you in Vincent's yet? Because you were either out or you were in. Hey, listen, there's nothing elitist about being a Christian. It is not a club to which only the squeaky clean are admitted by secret ballot. But, but it is for those who are in, in Jesus, trusting him, trusting personally in Christ for the forgiveness of their sin and for their, for their meaning and ultimate destiny in life. I, I wonder, have you worked this out yet? Has the penny dropped? Are you in? Because the real issue is not where you're at this morning, but whether you're in. For when you're in, you're in. And when we believe in Christ, all his blessings become ours. Do you know how it is when you attend one of those uh, big conferences? Maybe you did over the summer. We, we did. We, we joined the thousands at New Wine in July. You go to the registration desk, and they look for your name on the bookings list. And when they find it, they say, oh, yes, Mr. Baker, here you are. And they hand you your conference badge and your conference handbook with a map and your conference pen. Oh, do I get a pen as well? Oh, yes, you do. And here's an eraser and a, a token for a cup of coffee for later. Oh, and a free copy of the speaker's book. I get all of that? You do. Because your name is down. And because that means you're in. So I say again, are you in? I'm not asking, do you know the Bible inside out? and have all the answers and no problems in your life. I'm asking, are you in? Because if you're in, you're a saint. And if you're a saint, you get all the blessings of Jesus thrown in as well. And they're mentioned in verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the first two verses done. Gospel-centered churches, Gospel-centered people, servants and saints. Now, lastly, gospel-centered values. I thank my God every time I remember you. One of the obvious gospel-centered values in what follows is positive relationships. For, for these verses, as Mary read them, breathe the genuine warmth which existed between Paul and, and, and this, this, this church in Philippi. He loved them. He's writing a thank you letter because while he's been stuck in prison, they have again and again sent him food and money and even sent him one of their own people, Epaphroditus. He's brought news of the church at Philippi, told Paul what's going on, and it's Epaphroditus who has brought this letter back to them. And that partnership, says Paul, goes right back to the very start. And, 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 and you have consistently hung in there with me through good and bad times. I, I, I am more and more convinced that a gospel-centered church thrives on that kind of strong, committed, positive relationship network. Because, folks, it's what makes the journey manageable and worthwhile. Because you know as well as I do that in family and business and also in church, there are life cycles that we have to go through. The ups and downs, the ins and outs. That's the way it is for any group of people. Therefore, it's crucial that if Lansdowne is going to keep moving forward through these life cycles, then thankfulness to God for each other will oil the wheels and make those gear changes smoother. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. 
See, whenever Paul remembered these people, he was grateful to God for them. And his memory of them triggered his prayers. And his prayers triggered not just thankfulness, but joy. I always pray with joy for all the saints in all my prayers for all of you. And and there comes another second gospel-centered value, joyful prayer. Joy is a theme in the letter, by the way. Joyful prayer. A church that prays together stays together. And we have, don't we, this coming week, prayer emphasis week. That is a great opportunity to trigger a chain reaction of thanks and joy for each other before God. So I want to encourage you to commit to to coming to some of some or all of those various sessions through Pew, through Pew Prayer Emphasis Week, to tell God how grateful you are for each other. You see, what does prayer do? It gets underneath the lives of others and, and holds them up through the hard yards, through the hurts and the hurdles of life. And we do that corporately, together. Of course, here, Paul had his own personal reasons for remembering the Philippians in this kind of way. What does he say? I always pray with joy for you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Yeah, there's another key gospel-centered value. Partnership. Christians enjoy a common interest. We're in the gospel business together. We're shareholders. It's literally the meaning of, of, of that word partnership. In the old translation, it's fellowship. But actually, it's a remarkable term. It describes people in an enterprise together, shareholders. You see, that is a gospel-centered church value. We are partners together. We are keen to see the work expand and grow and develop. And and this church in Philippi had been like that with Paul from the get-go. Which is why his praying is not only joyful, but confident. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, remember where Paul is writing this? He's in prison. He's locked up under house arrest. But even there, Paul is confident about these people. Because he's confident in God and the gospel of grace. Because the God of grace produces finishers, not just starters. And from day one, these people had embraced Paul's mission as their mission. They wanted what he wanted. And that was the partnership that Paul was confident that God would complete right to the very end. To the day of Christ Jesus They were going to be in it for the long haul. And God would see to that. You see, that's, folks, that's why we ride out the bumps in the market, isn't it? Here we are. Some of you, as I look look out amongst the gathering this morning, some of you have lost your jobs. Some of you have lost your health. Some of you have lost a partner. Some of you are struggling with so much, but you're still here, you're still singing. You're still reading your Bible. You're still praying. Why? Because God has a long-term plan. And he's going to deliver on that. And you're part of it. And you're going to finish well. So when we are, because we are tempted to give up on Jesus, when we are tempted to drop out of church, keep going. Just another hour. Just one more day. Isn't that the way that uh, they motivate people in those bike spinning exercise classes at the gym? Ever been to one of those? I haven't. I have to confess. But as I walk towards the main fitness area in, in the Little Dan Center, I can hear from one of those darkened rooms along the corridor the instructor of the spinning class saying, Come on, people, just one more minute. That's all I'm asking for. Come on, push it one more time. I have never walked past that room and heard the instructor say, hey, right, give me 50,000 more. 
Come on, we've got another 49,999 to go. No, no. He says, one more, folks. One more. That's all I want. Give me one more. You see, if God has been at work in my life so that I'm in Christ, and therefore I'm a saint, and if I'm a saint and therefore called into partnership with other saints, it means that I will make progress towards that glorious day of Jesus Christ with one more step, with one more battle, with one more effort, with one more commitment, because God produces not just starters, but finishes. That is grace. That is work. And Paul says, you can be confident that what God has begun, he'll bring to completion in the life cycles of Lansdowne, in your life and mine. Just one more push. Just one more drive. Okay, give me one more minute before we wrap up. Because if that's how Paul prays for these Christians, thankfully, joyfully, confidently, and by the way, in verse 7, really affectionately, listen to him, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Verse 8, I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. We haven't got time to develop that, but he prays affectionately. That's how he prays, thankfully, joyfully, confidently, affectionately. Now, what does he pray for? Just the last minute. Devotion, verse 9, and this is my prayer, verse 9, that your love may abound more and more. Yeah, love for God, I think, but, but probably and mainly here, love for each other, love for them as a community. This overflowing love, this more and more abounding love is going to be pretty useful in Philippi if they are going to stand as one for the gospel together and ride out the storms of suffering and keep rowing the boat rather than rocking it. But it's not just a bigger heart for each other that Paul prays for, it's, it's love Devotion connected to knowledge and insight, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. You see, love needs to know how to see people and issues and respond to those things. And without such insight, such perception, love can often be little more than sentimentality. You see, practically, we need to be asking, what does it mean for me to love in this instance? How do I read this situation? What's appropriate in this relationship? Now, now why is this kind of informed devotion important? Because, says Paul, it generates discernment, verse 10, so that you will be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That word discernment carries the idea of testing something so as to approve it. That's what love is after. Love pursues what is best. It wants what is right, not just what works. Love wants the best solutions, the most helpful ways forward, the right decisions. And that will mean that it is what pure and blameless. Now, if you're using the King James Version, you'll see the word translated pure as sincere. I discovered that this week, that Sincere comes from the Latin word sine, sere. Sine, without, none. Sere, wax. Sincere literally means without wax. What's all that got to do with anything? Well, back in the first century, if you were a a potter making pots and jugs and things of clay, if you were an authentic pot maker, you would make your pots of clay Sincere, without wax. If you were a dodgy potter or dodgy pot maker, you would fill in the little cracks that sometimes appear with wax. And so what people did, if they were going to buy a pot, they would hold the, the pot up to the sky, to the sunlight, to see if it was sine sere, without wax. Then you knew you had the authentic thing. And that's what love, says Paul, is about. It tests, it approves what is pure and blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see, devotion drives discernment towards a destination. Until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. <laughs> We've had the fruit of a harvest in the summer this year. First time ever. Someone in the church, I think it was in the church, Sean will correct me afterwards, but, but I, someone gave us a tomato tree. Not, not a tree, that's not the right word, is it? A tomato plant. You can tell how much I know about tomatoes and tomato growing. Someone gave us this, this thing called a tomato tree. And, and anyway, I, I, didn't, I didn't particularly bother with it. I just let it be in the garden somewhere. Anyway, about a month ago, things started to appear on it. Little round things that were a bit green. And, and I said, hey, look, Sean, we've got some fruit here. And last week, we had the, the fruit of our harvest. Four tomatoes. <laughs> about this big. And they weren't that sweet either, by the way. But thank you for the, to the person who gave us the tomato uh, tree. It, it worked. We have had a, a, we've had a, a, a harvest of, of fruit. Here's Paul in prison. He's praying for this church and for these people whom he holds in his heart. And he's confident that there's going to be a harvest, that there's going to be fruit in their lives the evidence of the seed of their love for each other and the gospel will be this harvest of righteousness to God's glory. And every day, Paul is praying between now and that great day, there will be growth in the love of these people for each other. This gospel church, made up of gospel people, will conduct themselves with gospel values. They will sing off the same page. The character of their community will be gospel-shaped until the day when Paul's prayers will be completely answered. You see, it was that vision that inspires Paul with joy. And chains could not take that joy away from him. All divisions in the church. Because Paul knew what I hope we know at Lansdowne, what I hope you know in your own life, what, be what God begins, he will finish. He will bring home. So give me one more. Give me one more. Give me one more. God's grace will bring us home. Let's, pr let's pray together. Father, as we begin a new year together, we ask that we may be inspired by this vision of being a gospel-centered church where we proclaim and live out the message. And in that may we become the kind of church where people turn up maybe going to a prayer meeting, not believers, and they walk away having found Jesus. May we see lives transform this coming year. May we endure suffering for the sake of Jesus. Lord, may we be gospel people, servants to each other, rowing the boat of the gospel, not rocking it. And may we thank you that in Jesus Christ we are saints because it's not where we're at that's really important this morning. It's whether we're in. And Lord, may our values be gospel-centered. May we thank you for each other. May we build positive relationships. May we pray with joy and affection and with confidence. And Lord, may we, towards each other, abound more and more in love and depth of knowledge so that we might know that the God who's begun a good work in us will bring it to completion. And that there will be this harvest, this fruit of righteousness. Lord, so this year, grow our church life, we pray. Grow us as people. May we enjoy the confidence that we can have, the assurance that what you have started, you will complete until the day of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, O oh, church, arise.